Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. This month's show is about telescopes, specifically the world's great telescopes. I've put together a list of what I think are the uh, seven best scopes out there, uh, open to uh, opinion, of course, but within the time constraints of our program, here is our list. We're going to start out first with radio telescopes, and our first offering here will be the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, affectionately known as ALMA. When it's complete, uh, this telescope will actually have 66 dishes ranging in size from 12 down to 7 meters. Uh, they'll be located uh, at an altitude of 16,000 feet, very high up in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. And they'll be able to be positioned and repositioned over a large area and then linked together to form a large interferometer. In other words, making one large dish that would be the equivalent of one dish being 10 miles across. So that's quite an accomplishment. And of course, the resolution on such a telescope would really be great. Now, this telescope is a partnership uh, between Europe, Canada, the U.S., Japan, Taiwan, and the nation of Chile. And the telescope began its full operations uh, just this year. Now, in this image that you're going to see, taken by the ELMA telescope, it's actually a combination of shots from data from two different telescopes. First, the ELMA in the uh, radio waves, and then with some Hubble data in visible light added to it. So this is one of the first pictures from the ALMA. For our second radio telescope, we're going to travel a little bit farther north up to uh, Puerto Rico, where the Arecibo radio telescope is located. This telescope was built between 1960 and 63, and its original surface was made out of chicken wire. Now, I know that sounds rather odd, but the space between the strands and the chicken wire was smaller than the wavelength of the radio waves being discussed, so it worked. But in 1974, it was uh, refurbished with metal panels and received another upgrade again in 1997. Now, the disadvantage with this scope is it can't be aimed anywhere. It's built in a natural depression down in the ground, and so it can only see what passes over it. Uh, the good news is, though, that detector that you see high above the dish, supported by those three cables, that can be moved a bit to allow for greater flexibility in aiming the telescope. Now, while we have this disadvantage, an advantage of the Arecibo scope and the ELMA as well, is that you can use it day or night in clear weather or cloudy. Next, we'll move on to optical telescopes in visible light. And for our scope here, we're going to take a look at the Grand Telescope in the Canary Islands. Uh, this scope here is out in the Atlantic Ocean, which makes for a stable surrounding area. The water, the ocean, doesn't increase or decrease uh, very much in temperature, so the air around it is quite stable. It sits at a height of 7,500 feet, and the mirror itself is 10.4 meters, which is actually made up of 36 individual segments, which are controlled with adaptive optics, which makes for an even clearer image uh, than it would be without, even sitting at 7,500 feet. Now, this scope was built between 2002 and 2008, and uh, as of its building, it was the largest single aperture optical telescope around. This telescope was built in partnership with both Spain, Mexico, and the University of Florida, and initial observations began in 2009. Now, the image taken with the uh, Grand Telescope was actually part of its initial observations, and here we see uh, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, 
or I'm sorry, it's M74. We'll get to M51 a little bit later. This is M74, also a very fine face-on galaxy. And the little red arrow points to a supernova. It's a supernova 2013 EJ. And uh, you can see the quality work being done by this telescope. Next, we'll move on to the Pacific Ocean and to the islands of Hawaii and the WM Keck scopes, both one and two. Now, they're both built on top of Mauna Kea, which is an extinct volcano on the big island of Hawaii, at an elevation of 13,600 feet. The first scope, Keck 1, came online back in 1992, followed by Keck 2 in 1996. Now, they both have twin 10-meter mirrors. Again, 36 segments, just like the uh, Grand Telescope does, and it, too, has adaptive optics. Now, one of the great things about these two scopes is they can either be used individually or they can be used together as an interferometer. And what that does is it actually combines the two scopes along with the space in between them. And so in this case, using both scopes together, you've got the equivalent of a 280-foot diameter mirror. Uh, you could never build one uh, mirror only that big. And so the increased resolution is uh, really quite outstanding. Uh, the image we're going to show you is, in fact, this time, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's also known as NGC 5194 and 95. The 94 is the larger of the two galaxies, and 95 is the smaller sort of little pulp or bulb or knot, uh, however you want to refer to it, that you see to the left of the image. Now, this telescope uh, is operated as a joint venture by both uh, Caltech and the University of California. We're going to take a uh, short break. Uh, if you would like to get more information, uh, please visit our website. We'll have the website for you there at the bottom of the screen. And uh, right after Term of the Month with Stephen Witte, I'll be back with more of the world's great telescopes. The Term of the Month for February 2014 is Moon Images. So a lot has happened with telescopes since, 19, uh, since 1609 when Galileo pointed his first scope in, into the sky. He had a 15 millimeter diameter telescope, uh, maybe seven power, and he demonstrated it famously in 1609. But he also published, this is why we remember him, he published uh, his images of, uh, his drawings really of Jupiter and of the moon. Uh, so 15 millimeters across isn't very, very, isn't very large. In 1992, the Keck, uh, the mighty Keck telescope had its first light with its 10 meter uh, size. So if you think about it, um, it's uh, a little over 650 times the uh, light gathering area. The mighty Keck has an awful lot more light gathering uh, uh, ability than Galileo's original scope. And this is in 383 years. Now in computers, there's Moore's Law. Every year and a half, the number of parts on a chip doubles. Uh, well, Moore's Law for telescopes has a doubling approximately every 45 years. And since Galileo's scope, there have been about eight and a half doublings, uh, if you will. Now, in addition to the light gathering ability, there's also been a big magnification change. So Galileo's scope could magnify objects by about seven times. And this really does let you, it's as if you were one-seventh as far away from your object. So on the moon, if Galileo's uh, optics were great, and they weren't that great, but if they were great, then he should have been able to see as his smallest object something about 60 miles across. And yet, he was able 
because he had some training in art, he, had, he was able to uh, figure out how tall mountains were on the moon. Now, backyard telescopes today can see as their smallest objects somewhere between 10 and 20 miles across, so the bigger craters certainly. Now this is not nearly enough to see uh, the Apollo hardware left over by the astronauts, and even the mighty Keck telescope cannot distinguish the Apollo hardware left over by the astronauts. But we have a spacecraft in lunar orbit, and from about 15 miles up, it's a much smaller telescope, but it's at the moon. It's in orbit around the moon. From 15 miles up, uh, it has imaged all of the Apollo landing sites and also uh, 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 the Russian landing sites. They had uh, rovers that they put on the moon. So this is an image of Apollo 14, and you can see uh, sort of horizontally there uh, and up to the left, you can see footprints where the astronauts walked out um, to, uh, you know, to where they were going to collect uh, uh, moon rocks and they were going to do experiments. Uh, this was, uh, Apollo 14 was before the, uh, the famous lunar cars. Those, uh, those came in Apollo 15 and later. Um, so those uh, image areas are bigger. Uh, this was the, really the best uh, uh, image for the, for the screen I, I chose. Now, the Apollo astronauts brought back rocks and soil from the moon, and quite a bit of it. And here's an image of, of uh, some olivine taken from the moon, uh, from, I, I believe, uh, uh, Apollo 15. And this is at the, uh, the National Museum. Uh, and by bringing these rocks back to Earth, your effective magnification is ridiculous because not only can you see it close up naked eye like here, but um, scientists have used microscopes and seen, you know, a, a hundred thousandth of an inch across sections. So if you can imagine the effective magnifi magnification from the Earth, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you could imagine it. <laughs> it's really pretty impressive. And that is term of the month for February 2014, Moon Images. Thanks, Steve. Welcome back to our program on the world's great telescopes. We're going to shift over from reflectors to refractors and talk about the largest and second largest scopes of their kind in the world. We'll actually start out with the second largest, and this is the Lick Observatory Telescope. It was endowed by a rather eccentric California businessman by the name of James Lick. Uh, he paid for the construction of a 36-inch diameter reflect refractor. Uh, the lens was made by none other than Alvin Clark, and the rest of the scope built by the company of Warner and Swayze. Uh, for an image from this scope, we've uh, chosen none other than the beautiful M31 Andromeda Galaxy. And here you can see it right here along with its uh, companion galaxies just uh, above and to the right and immediately below. A fantastic picture. The Andromeda Galaxy is uh, one of the closest galaxies to us in the universe. Now, the observatory was built on top of Mount Hamilton at an elevation of 4,200 feet just east of San Jose, California. And it was, in fact, the first mountaintop observatory built in the United States. Now, they even had to build the road on the mountain to be able to get to the top. And what made this even more extraordinary, in, in my mind anyway, is the fact that this was done before the invention of trucks and other heavy vehicles. They had to use wagons and horses and mules to haul everything up the mountain to the observatory. Now the observatory began observations back in 1888 and as I mentioned is still in use 
today. There are several other telescopes up there at the Lick Observatory as well. One interesting little side note, though, about the Lick Observatory and the eccentric Mr. Lick. If you ever visit the observatory and you're there in the dome and you're by yourself and you think you're all alone, well, guess again. Because buried beneath the pier of the telescope is the said James Lick. And right there on the pier is a plaque that reads, Here lies the body of James Lick. Eccentric indeed. For our next refracting telescope, we will look at the largest one in the world. This is the Yerkes Telescope, operated by the University of Chicago, and it's located up in Williams Point, Wisconsin. It has a diameter of 40 inches and was also built by the combined companies of Alvin Clark and Werner and Swayze. Uh, in the past, uh, this scope has been used for both photographic and spectroscopic work, uh, but today it's used for electronic observations. Uh, going back to its early days, the image that we're going to show you for this scope, the Yerkes, is an image of M5. And uh, if we take a look at the image, you may notice that it seems a little fuzzy uh, compared to uh, some of the other images that we've uh, showed you on this program. And, well, there's a reason for that, actually, because this photo was taken back in 1900 using photographic plates. It represents a five-hour exposure. Now, this was even in the days before emulsion film and certainly in the days before uh, CDs sensors used on scopes today for electronic observations. But even though it is over a hundred years old, it is still a marvelous uh, photo to look at. Now, this uh, telescope came online in 1897, toward the end of the 19th century, but it also represented the end of an era. This was the, the last of the giant refractors that were built uh, coming on in the 20th century was the advent of the silver on glass reflectors. Uh, mirrors are easier to make. Uh, they're, they don't have the exacting criteria to get a good image with them that you do with a lens. Uh, with a mirror, there's only one surface to worry about. With a refractor, well, that lens has two surfaces that have to be perfect. So from there forward, we actually move to the days of the uh, giant uh, reflectors, such as the telescope, the Hooker telescope, also located in California. For our last telescope, uh, it is truly a great telescope of the world, but it isn't exactly of this world because it's up in space, and it's the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, I like to say that it's my telescope, and well, actually, it's all of our telescope. It belongs to us, the taxpayers. It was named for the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, and it was launched aboard uh, the shuttle Discovery in 1990 and uh, placed in an orbit of about 380 miles above the surface of the Earth. Here you can see a, a great view of the Hubble. It's actually about the size of a school bus. Now, the mirror itself is 94 inches in diameter, just a little under 8 feet, and it's designed to do imaging in three different levels of radiation, uh, the visible spectrum, uh, the stuff that we all see, and also ultraviolet and infrared. Now, the image we have uh, taken by the Hubble is one of the best ever taken, I think, by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the... Uh, Eagle Nebula M16, and this is actually a part of that nebula, and it's known as the Pillars of Creation. You can see in the image, if you look closely, there are little bumps or nodules coming off the side, and what you see there are actually suns and solar systems forming out of the dense cloud of dust and gas that we see in these pillars. Now, as we all know, the Hubble had a flaw, and uh, that flaw was corrected 
in 1993 with the installation of small mirrors to correct a misshapen main mirror. The grinding was off just a little bit. And so these bifocals, if you will, were installed that greatly improved the imaging performance of the Hubble. Now other servicing missions uh, by subsequent space shuttle flights uh, have kept this great telescope working at peak efficiency for many years to come. Now the inspiration for me for this uh, program was uh, through a book that I read called uh, Stargazing, The Life and Times of the Telescope. And uh, there are actually 20 scopes listed in the book and I've sort of whittled it down to uh, what I think are the top seven. I, I hope you agree with me. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to send our way about this show or any other, you can send us an email. The email address is down there at the bottom of your screen. But before we get to what's up, what we normally go to at this point, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to remind you of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club's upcoming Expo and Swap, which is happening Saturday, March 15th, 2014. It will be held again at the same place it has for many years in the gymnasium of Holy Cross Lutheran Church, which is located in Livonia on six mile between Middle Belt and Merriman. There will be tables there with amateur astronomers who are trying to sell their old or no longer needed equipment. Uh, you can find some great deals there. We will have some vendors uh, selling new equipment and there will also be presentations by a number of club members on a variety of topics. Also scheduled to be there once again is Starlab, the uh, portable planetarium uh, brought to you through the courtesy and uh, kind offices of the Michigan Science Center. So that will be there as well for uh, lectures inside the planetarium, tours of the night sky. So we hope you can make it. Again, that is Saturday, March 15th in the gymnasium of Holy Cross Lutheran Church on Six Mile between Middle Belt and Merriman in Livonia. We hope to see you there and coming up next with What's Up, our own Steve Woody. What's up in the night sky for February 2014? Now as m the month of February moves on, the days are getting a little longer. So the sun rises a half an hour earlier and sets a half an hour later by the end of the month. Sunrise through the month is around 7.30 and it sets around 6 p.m. The first quarter moon happens on February 6th. The moon is full on va Valentine's Day, so this is, you know, the moon is up all night. This is the perfect time to promise your sweetheart the moon. Third quarter is February 22nd. Now, despite Valentine's Day, the new moon could not get a date in February, so there is no new moon in February at all. Jupiter is up all night. It's in Gemini and it's between the stars Castor and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is in Orion. Uh, Castor is one of the twins in, uh, in Gemini. Now if, you're, if you have a telescope and you're looking at uh, Castor and Pollux and you can't remember which one is which, Castor is the one that's visibly a multiple star. It's at least a double star system in most scopes. Now on February 10th, the moon happens to be near Jupiter. Mars and Saturn are best viewed around 6 a.m. during this month. On February 20th, the moon comes in and visits Mars and Saturn. 6 a.m. is also good for looking at Venus, and that's in the east. 
February 26th has the moon uh, all <laughs> with, uh, with Venus. You know, the moon is going to visit everybody. Now, Venus is a little higher as you get toward the end of the month, so it's a little easier to see, but Venus is quite bright all month long. Mercury has inferior conjunction, that is that it comes right by the sun on February 15th. So it's an evening object at the beginning of the month, and at the end of the month, it's a morning object. So here we are at 6 a.m. The moon visits Mercury and Venus on February 28th. And that's what's up in the night sky for February 2014. Keep looking up. It's the greatest free show overhead every night of the year.